Thank you for watching this video from the Center for European Studies at Carleton University. This event was organized by the Center for European Studies and Canada-Europe Transatlantic Dialogue and supported by Carleton University and by grants from the European Union and Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. The views expressed in this video are solely those of the presenter and do not reflect the views of the European Union, Center for European Studies, and Carleton University. Well, first of all, I want to thank Carleton University for inviting me, and particularly the Center for European Studies. This is a, a, it's a great invitation, and I'm really happy for that. Uh, and it's uh, my, the invitation you, you made to me. It's, uh, it's nice because I am quite exotic. Uh, I'm exotic in two ways. On the one hand, I am an economist. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I have seen a lot of economists around here. And on the second way I'm exotic because I come, I think I am the only one who comes from a southern European country, which I think has specifics and Spain has particularities. Uh, I will not talk about Spain, but I'll be around. So if you want to talk to me about, ask me something about this, about Spain, uh, you know, we have been traditionally a, a leader um, of renewable energy and uh, I mean, I'll be around to, to answer any question. My talk today is different, however, it's about, um, uh, it's, it's trying to answer those who pretend that uh, a carbon price will solve everything and, do, and therefore that we will not need renewable energy targets, that we will not need dedicated uh, renewable energy support. Um, in fact, I will argue that uh, we need both instruments. In fact, we need a policy mix of instruments. We, a, a, a single instrument cannot solve everything. Um, well, uh, everything is written in papers, so actually what I'm telling you today is a summary of uh, previous work. Uh, a structure along this, these lines, um, uh, we have this mainstream economic view that uh, renewable energy support, dedicated renewable energy support is very, very bad. Uh, uh, or redundant in the best cases and even very, very bad in the worst cases. And then I will argue that if you take a different alternative economic view, it makes perfect economic sense to combine uh, dedicated support with a carbon price. Um, so what's the mainstream view tell us? Um, well, they tell us that uh, targets for renewable energy crowd out cheap mitigation alternatives. Since uh, renewable energy uh, technologies are not the cheapest uh, way to abate emissions in, ma in many occasions, once you introduce uh, these uh, renewable energy technologies through a quota in an ETS, you reduce, the, you crowd out those uh, cheapest alternatives. It's ineffective because uh, the CO2 emissions are already covered by the cap, and it's also inefficient because it results in high compliance cost. Um, there's also this idea that uh, we should not pick winners, that we should have technology neutrality, and so on and so forth. There's a second, um, a second argument made by the mainstream economic view, which is a little bit more sophisticated, which uh, tells us that uh, there are conflicts um, due to the negative impact on the carbon price. This means uh, that uh, renewable energy generation reduces um, uh, the, the, the CO2 prices because it results in lower uh, demand for allowances. And since it reduces the CO2 prices, it favors the most uh, carbon intensive technologies, uh, coal versus gas. Um, so it's, renewables are very, very bad in this, uh, in this context. Um, well, this, this uh, mainstream view actually, uh, in my opinion, is short-sighted. It's narrow, and it doesn't take into account many other handbooks on the, in the economic literature, telling us very important things that justify why we should have a combination of instruments. And uh, the first one is some of these uh, mainstream uh, economics uh, doesn't take into account very relevant insights from innovation economics, and also from the system of innovation approaches that tell us that we have three externalities. We have an environmental externality. We, all, we have been talking about this during the whole sessions uh, yesterday and today. 
We have an innovation externality. This means that uh, uh, an innovator who invests in uh, R&D, in innovation, uh, bears all the cost and uh, may not receive all the gains from the, his innovation because this innovation is copied by others. So there are spillovers, and so uh, we would lead to an infra-optimal uh, uh, level of R&D investment. And there's also a diffusion externality in the sense that the cost of, uh, of the technologies uh, start to be very high and they go down the learning curve. So those investors, those adopters of the technology in the first instance, they pay very high cost for the technology and before it, it goes down it, their learning curve. And those uh, laggers benefit from a lower cost of the technology. So. Um, in reality, we do not have only an externality, an environmental externality. If we have an environmental externality, fine. Let's go for the CO2 price. But the CO2 price only accounts for this, can only do, can only tackle the environmental externality, not the other two. Uh, we have, we have market, several market failures. We know from theory, as back as, uh, at least as back as 1952, that uh, we have to combine instruments to tackle different market failures, and we have different market failures. So uh, it is, uh, the, the ETS is in fact unable to tackle the innovation externality and the deployment externality. It provides an insufficient incentive for innovation. There is a lot of research being done on this, on the UTS already, showing that the ETS has led to very few patents uh, in itself, showing that, the, that it has resulted in mostly incremental technological change not the type of change that we need to decarbonize to a large extent. So we need a supply push, of course, the R&D investments, and we also need a demand pool. ETS is one part of this demand pool, but there are other instruments, and renewable energy policy play a role in this demand pool uh, as, as a demand pool uh, force. Also, we have, uh, in economics, we have uh, very nice literature, very, uh, with a long tradition on public choice, political economy reasoning. This means that uh, things uh, are not always uh, uh, done in the best effective way because there are influences, power influences. It's not only economists who have discussed this, also political sciences as well, but in economics, this is discussed as well. And when we take into account political economy considerations, we may ask ourselves if carbon prices, which are credible and at very high levels, are really, really, really feasible. Can we expect to have very, very high CO2 prices which would internalize the environmental externality, the innovation externality, the deployment externality, and lead to a sufficient incre increase in renewable energy deployment? I doubt so, that the prices, carbon prices could be at such a high level, strictly for political economic reasons. Because both incumbents and or, and or countries and our governments in countries would be against this. So I don't think this is, I think this is very, very important. Also, it, it, uh, it uh, uh, takes into account the, uh, the specific features of the climate change problem, where there is a temporal asymmetry of benefits and costs. The costs are, are fall in the short term, and the benefits fall in the medium and long term. So the, the not, in my term, not in my term in office syndrome, I think, is very important in this, in this one. Also, what, mo what do model simulation tell us? They tell us a lot of, a lot of things. For example, work undertaken at the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change in, uh, in, uh, in Germany tell us that uh, a second best strategy where uh, we use a lot of deployment support for renewal will lead to lower cost compared to a situation where we have delayed climate change agreement and no early renewable energy deployment. So I think this is very important that we are playing with three scenarios. The first verse is great, but it's a rose view of the world as a first verse. Yeah, we have a carbon price, That's, that will never happen. The second scenario is less, we will have a delayed climate agreement. So if we have a delayed climate agreement, the best thing you can do is to uh, invest in renewables. At least this will lead you to the uh, two degrees at lower cost than doing nothing and uh, waiting for the problem to, to, to be... Uh, and well, there are others, um, there are other uh, um, reasons as well, which I will not uh, detain too much on that. Uh, actually, a major failure of the um, 
conventional view is that it takes the uh, climate change problem as a, a static phenomenon. Uh, it's a static view of things. We are not dealing with a picture. We are dealing with a movie. We have to sing, and we are, when we're dealing with innovation, we are dealing with a movie. It's like an adult and has stages. The costs are reduced over the long time. So actually, what the model simulations made with the Green X model from the Vienna University of Technology tell us is that promoting technological changes uh, in renewables uh, may be costly in the short term, for sure, but cheaper, much cheaper in the long term. And this uh, uh, intertemporal conflict between short term and long term fishing is, is critical to understand th this, these issues. We, we need to put technologies on the shelf, not only to take technologies from the shelf, as said from the Gothenburg uh, people. This means that we need some instruments that put the technologies there, and the ETS is highly unlikely to do that by itself. Um, also, it seems that CO2 is the only problem that we have. And it seems that the only criteria that we have to assess climate change is effectiveness and cost effectiveness. I would argue that this is not the case. Policymakers have many, well, several assessment criteria to, to assess policies. Of course, they care about, and they are interrelated. These assessment criteria are interrelated, of course. They want to be effective, they want to be cost effective, but they also want to be politically feasible. So arguing that it's just, we put a carbon price there, will do not help to, to policymakers in the real world. Actually, some of them tell me that. Okay? We, we know these economists who tell, who tell us about carbon price, but we need something else because we, 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 I mean, we cannot live with that. You know? So combinations may be justified because they are politically feasible, even if it, this is not the most efficient outcome, most efficient in the blackboard view, view textbook book view. And also, they have other goals. So when we judge something in the energy realm, we have to just, how we achieve all the goals combined at the least cost, not one goal. We may achieve one goal and the other goals just simply disappear or do, we, we do not uh, achieve them at the, at the lowest cost. So uh, I think this is, this is important to, to take into, into account. A main question would be, does uh, empirics uh, show that there has been indeed a negative interaction between renewable energy deployment and the ETS? The answer is no. No, it hasn't. The evidence so far, what they show, is that uh, the socioeconomic, first, the socioeconomic benefits of adding a REST target to an ETS might compensate the additional efficiency cost. This is done with the PRIMES model, highly respected model in the EU. And on the other hand, um, we can see a very modest impact of REST on CO2 emissions reductions and ETS prices in the last decade because other factors are, have been much more important, in particular, the economic crisis. So uh, according to Spencer, for example, et al., uh, 2014, they uh, argued that the lower, that the reduction in CO2 prices, only 10% of this reduction can be accounted for by renewable energy deployment policies. So I think that, uh, we, I mean, we, we have to, we have to think uh, twice before saying that things are very bad or very wrong. I, I think I like a, a nuanced view of, of things. Uh, on the other hand, um, what if we have a negative interaction? We may have a negative interaction, but we can solve it. How? With coordination. We can even mitigate it with instrument choice. We can, we can even mitigate it with design elements. What is coordination? What does coordination mean? If we know we are going to deploy a certain amount of renewable energy in the next 10 years, we can figure out, of course, it's not easy, but we can do it. We can figure out the amount of uh, CO2 emissions that will be reduced as a result of REST deployment in the future and use this information to uh, select the cap, okay? to fix the cap. Do it accordingly. If we do that, there's coordination between both targets and not necessarily a negative interaction between REST support and the ETS cap. Okay? Of course, again, it's relatively difficult to do it, but you can do it. So um, the question would be, of course, if uh, the targets have been coordinated in the EU. I think they weren't in the first uh, uh, ETS period, uh, January 2005, 2007, uh, but they have been increasingly coordinated as far as I know. Okay? But the, uh, I mean, the, the fact that it has not been done doesn't, doesn't mean that it cannot be done in the future. 
So uh, also uh, regarding instrument choice, uh, I mean, uh, not all the, uh, the the interaction between both areas depends to a certain extent on the choice of the instrument we do choose. Okay, it, it, it uh, depends on whether we choose a quantity-based or price-based instrument, both in the REST instrument real and in the CO2 real. If we choose a, a price instrument in the CO2 real, for example, a carbon task, with a carbon task, that, neg that negative interaction is much mitigated because the price is fixed. So there is no influence of renewable energy on that CO2 tax. Okay? And the same happens with the instruments that uh, uh, Bolmar mentioned before uh, regarding renewable energy policies. With uh, some, some instruments, you, you can have, I mean, it's, it's not so clear that you will have an instrument interaction when you choose one instrument or another. It's, it's not so simple. The same thing with design elements. Okay? If you have feeding premium uh, cap, this negative interaction does not exist. So again, it is influenced by a range of factors. In a, in, it is not an unavoidable fact of life that there will be a uh, and a negative interaction. Okay, well, I, I come to the conclusions here. Um, basically, the coexistence of the REST target with the EU ETS has received considerable criticism in the past. Uh, but I, are, I have, as I have argued, I think that we have to put things into perspective. And uh, uh, when we take into account different approaches in the economics, in the economics realm, then we may think twice when saying that there has been a negative interaction. Uh, there is also several implications at different levels. One of, uh, at a, for example, at a methodological level, this means that we should combine different economic perspectives for the analysis of policy mixes, and also, of course, beyond uh, economics, uh, to to uh, to use also the, the, the views of uh, political scientists and other social sciences as well. But uh, in the policy uh, implications realm, I think we have. I would say just three main conclusions, three main implications. First, the one is self-evident. The policy mix of an ETS and REST targets is clearly justified. Uh, you can feel that from my, from my talk. That we have different market failures, different goals, different assessment criteria. This means that we need a combination. Um, so I think that, that, the, that the challenge is rather to see it in a different way. Uh, in contrast to the mainstream view, we could do the other way around, take into account the non-CO2 benefits of REST as the main goal of its deployment and consider the CO2 emissions reductions as the side effect, uh, and then adapt the CO2 cap accordingly, as, as I mentioned before. Um, I mean, the mainstream view, again, REST deployment has a negative impact on carbon prices, but we can do also a different take a different view when we take, for example, uh, public choice uh, analytics here. Since race deployment has a depressing effect on the carbon price, race support could make it more politically feasible to implement more stringer CO2 targets. I mean, it's, it's the other way around. Um, so I, mean, I, would, I would say that both types of policies uh, mutually uh, affect each other, but in a beneficial way. Okay, so it's not, uh, it's not an all, everything is not so negative. Of course, someone will tell me, well, policy combinations could create problems. Sure, policy combinations are not a panacea. That's for sure. That's a, we are talking about the second best, not the first best. Okay? But policy uh, conflicts can be mitigated through appropriate design. Okay? And in any case, it's much better than this ideal world that we live in sometimes that we just uh, CO2 price we just uh, cover everything. We'll solve the negative externality, the innovation externality, the deployment externality. We'll also solve my kids' homework and uh, whatever, you know? So I, I think this doesn't go anywhere. And in fact, it does not give real policy advice to policymakers, which uh, are asking and requiring this. Okay, thank you very much, and I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you.